Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversation. Today we will be discussing two of the most talked about strategic concepts of our times, the Indo-Pacific and the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue or the Quad. They are two very different things and yet very interrelated. What is the latest on the Quad? Is India soft pedaling the Quad? We will try and understand the origins, evolution and the implications that these two concepts have for India's national security. And to do so, I have with me in the studio Commander Abhijit Singh. He is a retired naval officer and is currently the head of the Maritime Policy Initiative at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. He has previously worked with the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis and the National Maritime Foundation. He is a prolific writer on all issues maritime. Welcome to the National Security Conversation, Commander Abhijit. Thank you. Thank you. Abhijit, if you may begin by asking you, you've written a great deal about the Indo-Pacific and the Quad. Uh, tell us about the origins of this geopolitical construct called the Indo-Pacific. Um, what are the implications such a concept, such a construct have for India and its region? Yeah. So, so you see, the Indo-Pacific, the, the, the construct has so energized the strategic community that it almost seems as if all roads either lead to it or lead from it. Right. Uh, but you know, it's best to think of the Indo-Pacific as a strategic system. A strategic system spanning two oceans and two continents, which is the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, Africa and Asia. That creates opportunities for uh, the member states to interact with each other and optimize their efforts. It has been described variously uh, by different analysts as an area where uh, nations come together to, to uh, meet their interests. But I would say that it, this is just not a question of meeting interests. This is also about looking for ways in which you can generate alternatives to proposals that already exist. And therefore, I think the Indo-Pacific as a concept has a peculiar charm in the, in the minds of uh, maritime analysts in that it, it, it creates uh, a greater opportunity for all, all the partners within the region to come and begin to uh, work together, look at uh, mutual security issues and look at how they can share capacity. And in that sense, it's a, it's a really enabling uh, construct. Uh, having said that, I'd like to add that there is not one, but really three interpretations of the, of the Indo-Pacific. I mean, Different people, different countries tend to see it in different ways, but broadly the different interpretations fall into three category sets. India's uh, view of the Indo-Pacific, shared by a lot of other states in the region, is that this is uh, essentially uh, about conciliation. It's about, uh, it's about finding ways to work with other partners. So India lays a great deal of em emphasis of, on inclusiveness. And if you were to listen to, say, Prime Minister Modi that in, at, in, the, in Singapore at the, at the Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, he was clear that this is about stakeholdership. Uh, not, this, is, this, is, this is not a group that wishes to dominate. And least of all, this is not a containment strategy. So Mr. Modi was hinting at the fact that we would be happy to work with China. Uh, and, uh, mm, mm, and, it, and if the ch Chinese are willing to abide by a certain basic set of rules, norms and principles, China can be a responsible stakeholder in the region. He didn't say it in words, but that is what he alluded to. So that's a conciliatory concept. It's a, it's a very conciliatory concept of the Indo-Pacific and a lot of states uh, agree with. The one state that doesn't actually agree with us or might have a completely different understanding of this is actually the US. And the US is a very confrontational model. So uh, if you were to look at... Uh, 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 Secretary James Mattis, uh, Secretary of Defense Jim, uh, who, who spoke at the same conference, he was mentioning red lines and a rules-based order. What the Chinese are in violation of, how they are flouting international rules, the, the UNCLOS, uh, mm, mm, reclaiming uh, sea features, building islands. Uh, and his take is that uh, China is a geopolitical competitor that does not abide by the rules and we simply have to look for ways to to confront and contain China. But even India, India has talked about rule-based order in the past. In that is correct. China. You are absolutely right. India does mention the rules-based order, but it does not lay a, a, too much of emphasis on, on the rules-based order because its primary objective is to look for ways in which to uh, in socialize China and make it 
uh, more amenable to accept uh, the Indo-Pacific as a construct and work with the regional partners. Because the biggest geopolitical reality of our times that the Indo-Pacific as a construct actually recognizes is the rise of China. And as many analysts have noted that this is essentially a China, a China containment strategy. The Chinese believe this is a China containment strategy. But none of the players are actually willing to say that. They are not saying this is a China containment strategy. They are simply saying that we have got to look for ways in which we can accommodate the interests of China in a way that they, it does not harm the interests of the other partners. So we want to socialize China in a way for it to act in responsible ways and, and agree with our understanding of the rules and orders. What's the third definition? The third definition is a very interesting one. That's a more pragmatic version, but I say that's also a, a little bit of a problematic version, which is the ASEAN construct. The ASEAN says that we can work with all sides uh, and we want China to be an equal stakeholder in the governance institutions in the region. And that would mean, and they don't say it in as many words, but that's essentially what they mean. But, but what they're pretty clear about that this Western based understanding of rules and orders is something that's unacceptable. So when the West stresses too much on accountability, transparency, uh, freedom of navigation, uh, freedom of overflight, uh, access to the commons, that is all code language for uh, containing China or calling out Chinese aggression in the South China Sea. And ASEAN does not walk, want to walk down that route. But there is more similarity between the Indian concept and the ASEAN concept. There right? is a similarity between India, Indian concept and the uh, ASEAN construct to the extent that they both want to carve out a place for, for, for China. The difference being that India believes that there has to be space for a hedging strategy. That if the Chinese do not resort to or do not accept the rules and the, uh, the rules and norms, the principles in the region, then we've got to in some ways begin to push China back. There has to be space for pushing back China. To me, it seems as if the ASEAN is not willing, for, willing to do that because China is a major stakeholder in, in, China, in, in ASEAN uh, plans and projects, especially to build connectivity. And the ASEAN does not want to go that route of really China, calling out China for its aggression in the sea. Despite the fact that a lot of countries that have a dispute with China uh, in, uh, uh, in the South China Sea are Southeast Asian states. But it, uh, it, it is almost clear that if we want to place uh, ASEAN front and center uh, uh, um, of the, of the Indo-Pacific construct, and we have said that ASEAN is central to all of this, we will have to accept some version of the ASEAN uh, Indo-Pacific uh, mm, idea. But there, I think the real tension is between the American construct and the Indian Indian understanding of the Indo-Pacific, right? I How do we reconcile that? I mean, what implications thereof if there is no reconciliation between the between these competing worldviews of the Indo-Pacific? What implications will they have for India and the region? I think in order to understand that, we've got to, we've got to step back and actually look at the way in which the free and open Indo-Pacific concept has evolved. And the free and open Indo-Pacific concept actually is very dif different from the Indo-Pacific concept that first Prime Minister Abe spoke about when he visited India in 2007. That's the first time we heard about the idea of the Indo-Pacific and he spoke about the confluence of the two seas in which he said that this is about a dynamic coupling of the Indian Ocean and the, and the Pacific and he spoke in metaphoric terms about let's look at ways in which we can share, uh, share interests and responsibilities and, and find ways of working together. Uh, what has happened that over a period of time, that understanding has, has now led to this new model of a free and open Indo-Pacific that is nothing but a system of rules. It's called a rules-based order. And on the rules-based order, the real debate is as follows. There's a school of thought, and there's some within India that subscribe to the school of thought, is that there's no point just setting out rules uh, that restrict partners in doing certain kinds of activities. So let's have just rules where we agree to work on certain areas, but there's other areas mm -hmm. that we agree to disagree on. Uh, China primarily believes in this, in this model, that if it's South China Sea, if it's uh, activities within the EEZs, we will agree to disagree and we will simply not uh, consider this, uh, this, this item uh, in our discussion. Uh, well, the Americans say that nothing is out of the fray. Everything should be discussed because essentially the rules-based order is about maritime conduct. And if your conduct is leaves something to be desired, well then you cannot be said to be abiding by the rules. So the Americans have a, have a very black and white understanding of the rules-based order. 
the Chinese, while they don't discuss this openly, uh, neither the Indo-Pacific nor the rules-based order, but academics that support the Chinese position, uh, especially some academics within Australia, say that the uh, Chinese have signed on to the UNCLOS. Uh, they have a certain worldview. They are doing what is best in their national interest. And if there are areas in which they don't agree with the, with, uh, with the Americans, they should be allowed to do so. Now, you're right in saying that India and the U.S. don't agree on certain things. And that is really the, the, the deficit that we have with the U.S. One, we don't agree with the U.S. the way the U.S. does the freedom of navigation operations. The so what are some of the outstanding differences between the American uh, freedom of navigation um, exercises? There and, are and a number of... There are, uh, there are a few few differences that we have with the American position. One on, on, on freedom of navigation, our, our difference with the Americans is that the Americans believe that, that you can pass through EEZs as well as the territorial waters uh, if it's innocent passage. Right. Territor territorial waters if it's innocent passage, EEZs in any case, there is, no, there is no reason why we should be informing the coastal state about what we are doing in these waters because, because, th because these are the high seas. India does not hold that position. India says that uh, in the EEZs, we need to be notified. Uh, the Chinese take an even stronger position. They say that we, you need prior authorization, prior authorization before doing anything like this in the... So in, in that sense, our position is a bit, bit closer to the Chinese than it, it is to the Americans. Even though on, on the matter of what's happening in the South China Sea, we are on the same page with the US. We agree what the Chinese are doing in those waters is an aggression of sorts. But here is a problem. Now, we are, we, the, the, at, at this point of time, India's biggest strategic partner is the United States of America. And yet, we seem to have a radically different position from that of the United States when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so the Americans may go on to make the Indian, Indian, Indian side very happy, go on talking about Indo-Pacific. But at the end of the day, there is a definitional um, uh, difference here between what the Americans think of it and what the, the Indians think of it. Does it? Does that? Will Will that lead to some 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 trouble in the days to come in terms of sort of uh, um, you know um, strategic um, alliances and all of that in the, in the, in the in the region? Look, I don't think that's going to really lead to too much of a problem because this is not as if uh, we. Uh, we are unhappy with the way the U.S. is interpreting uh, the law. We simply say that we are not in agreement completely with, with, with what the U.S. is doing. But we, our fundamental problem is not with U.S., it's with China. It is only we tell the Americans that if you push the line that you are taking too much, then the Chinese can use the same, same principle and begin to uh, stalk our waters. In the sense, the Chinese can then begin to deploy their submarines and their ships within our EEZs if the principle that you say is, is correct. So, so whilst we disagree with, with you on the matter, we, we disagree with you for the reason that this will give China greater reason to be present in our waters than it has, it has done so far. Uh, and, and that is going to create a big, big uh, complication for us. So, uh, so we want the, the U.S. to take our views on board and moderate its, uh, its, uh, its stand on the matter in a way that it does not provoke China too much. Uh, so we think that without provoking China, we can still, we can still make all sides achieve their, their, their national aims within the Indo-Pacific region. Commander, let me take you back and, and sort of try and ask you a very simplistic sort of a question. Yeah. How does the whole construct of Indo-Pacific make a difference to the regional scheme of things? Why is that, why is that an important geo-maritime imagination at all? You know, um, uh, when um, the Indo-Pacific is, is about aligning of mental maps. And for a long time, uh, uh, there were many that believed that the Indian Ocean region and the Pacific region were two fundamentally different strategic theatres. There's nothing in very uh, common between them. What the Indo-Pacific does is that it tells you that, that it, they're not, not so different really. That uh, there, is, uh, there is a dynamic that is playing out in the, in the Pacific that is not as dissimilar to what is happening in the Indian Ocean as, as it was in the past. So there's a certain seamlessness in the... There is a certain seamlessness. Of course, it's not the same. You, can, you can't say that the, that the disputes that are there in the South China Sea are similar kind of disputes in the Indian Ocean, not at all. But look at the militarization happening across the place. The, the fact that the Belt and Road Initiative is there in the Pacific, it's there in the Indian Ocean region. China is a reality in the Pacific. China is a reality in the Indian Ocean region. The non-traditional security issues, uh, be it overfishing or be it piracy or be it armed robbery, all of that that is happening in both spaces. So there's, there's, there's reason for, for, uh, for, 
for countries on both sides to cooperate. But really and most importantly, the reason why uh, we countries, us countries should come together and consider the Indo-Pacific to be a sort of a coherent, seamless construct is because of the dearth of capacity. Neither India, nor Australia, nor Japan ha really has the capacity to take care of the non-traditional security issues as well as Chinese aggression in, in, the, in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean. We have simply got to look for ways in which we can come together to present a common front. And that is, I think, the one reason that drives uh, India to accept the Indo-Pacific region, even though, as I mentioned, we, we are not going whole hog. Uh, we're, we're, we see this as a vision. This is not really a strategy for us. The U.S. treats it as a strategy. The, the, uh, the, uh, the Australians and the Japanese treat it as a policy. We simply say this is a vision. This is simply a vision for us to work together with all, with all sides. And most importantly for us, this is something that, that does what? It, it, it highlights the importance of the Act East uh, policy, it showcases the Act East policy, and it also in some ways uh, creates the incentive for India to do more with, with, the, with its specific partners. So would you say India should focus more on the Western Indian Ocean region? Would that be your way of looking at it? Or? My way of looking at it is that if there is one region within the Indian Ocean region where there is actually an emerging uh, conflict of interests, uh, that is the Western Indian Ocean, not so much the South, China, uh, uh, not so much South Asia. India's problem in the South Asia is that a lot of the Chinese submarines and ships that come uh, pass through this region. And when the Chinese sub the Chinese deploy the submarines to South Asia, we don't have too much of an idea of where these submarines are right. deployed. And that's a major problem. That's a major problem in right. South Asia. But really, these uh, 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 where the Chinese want to be at this moment is is the Western Indian Ocean in Djibouti. They have uh, emerging partnerships uh, on the on the coast of uh, East Africa, right. with the, uh, with Tanzania, Kenya, Mozambique, all of that. Uh, this is not to say that South Asia is not important. The Chinese also have a partnership with uh, with uh, with Sri Lanka, with with Pakistan, and and a certain salience in in the Bay of Bengal. Right. So from India's point of view, uh, the Bay of Bengal and South Asia is important. But the but the Chinese are really eyeing the Western Indian Ocean because their logistical shipments. The energy flows all happen from that end of the Western Indian Ocean, flow through the flow through South Asia, and into the Pacific. So for them, really, South Asia is more like a more of a conduit. Yeah. Uh, and um, so India should therefore focus on the Western Indian Ocean. India should be focused on the uh, Western Indian Ocean. Does India have the capacity to focus on the uh, on the Western Indian Ocean? I'm not so sure. I think at this moment we have the capacity to be uh, um, a, a relevant power in South Asia. Uh, and uh, and with our partners, we could do we could do more than what we have so far in the Western Indian Ocean. But I don't think we will have that kind of prominence that we have in in South Asia. But my thesis is that more importantly, if we have to counter China in some ways, we should have counter presence in the Western Pacific, which we haven't done so far. We say that the entire Indian Ocean region, as per uh, as per our maritime strategy, is an area of primary interest, and we look at the South China Sea and the Western Pacific as an area of of secondary interest. Which, which basically is quote for saying that we have nothing to do what, with what happens in that part of the world. Right. How do, how do you look at the whole discussion about the quadrilateral security dialogue or the quad into this, into this larger discussion of, on, on Indo-Pacific? See, the quad is an, uh, is an informal uh, strategic dialogue between the four big democracies in, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, up until now, it has not been seen as a grouping that uh, that can in any ways challenge China or that wants to challenge China. But I see that uh, the Quad, uh, the essential rationale of setting up the Quad uh, has to do with countering China. Uh, the fact that uh, that the Chinese are extremely aggressive in the in the, in the Western Pacific. In fact, you wrote in 2007, 2017 that the truth of the Indo-Pacific has always been about balancing the rise of China. Underlying India's maritime moves in Southeast Asia was the need to contain China. That is correct. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. So, you see, the, uh, uh, the reason why I wrote that because I was at that point having a sort of a running debate with uh, Captain Kurana, who's uh, uh, who's the executive director of the National Maritime Foundation, and a very fine analyst. And, uh, and so my sort of limited disagreement with Captain Kurana on this point was that uh, Captain Kurana's uh, understanding of the Indo-Pacific region was that there was really no China element in the way the Indo-Pacific uh, um, evolved. 
that this was simply about us all coming together to look for ways in which we can expand our opportunities to work and also uh, address security issues and I agree with, with him on that point. But I'm saying that something that was tacit and, and inherent and something not really spoken about was, was the China factor. The fact that, that Abe, uh, Prime Minister Abe came to India and talked about the issue at a time when China was rising and it, beca it had become very clear that China is going to be a force to reckon with in, in the Pacific and that, us, that the remaining countries would have to look for ways in which to offer some kind of pushback to growing Chinese presence in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean. And we are talking about Indo-Pacific, we are not even talking about the Quad. We are not talking about the Quad, we are talking about the Indo-Pacific. And this is interesting because in the early, earlier on you said that uh, the Americans have a more competitive sort of understanding of Indo-Pacific, right. Indians have a more conciliatory understanding. Yes. And one of the reasons why the Indian side has a conciliatory approach about or conciliatory definition about the Indo-Pacific is because it does not really want to be on the wrong yeah. side of the Chinese. Yeah. Um, and yet you as an analyst are arguing that the Indo-Pacific is essentially about checkmating China in the region. Look, uh, uh, I have a certain understanding of the Indo-Pacific. It's not necessary that the government of India agrees with, with what I have to say. What, yeah. what my understanding is that in the way that the concept evolved, there was always a China element to it. And uh, for a lot of these countries, the truth of the matter was that there was no need to rebrand the Asia-Pacific as the Indo-Pacific, except for the need to draw India into the conversation on the Asia-Pacific. So for, for, for the US, for Australia and for Japan, the Indo-Pacific is essentially the Asia-Pacific plus India. Right. They wanted to draw India into what was happening in the Asia Pacific. India does not quite see it that way. India, India believes that its stakes are in the Indian Ocean and the Indo-Pacific actually is a coupling of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific and that the affairs of the Indo-Pacific are as much of a concern to all of these countries as the affairs, uh, I'm sorry, the affairs of the Indian Ocean are as much as a, as a concern to all of these countries as the affairs of the Pacific. But India agreed, I think even in 2007 there was agreement that China would be uh, would uh, would be a factor to look out for, and that we would have to look for ways in which we can come together to uh, to present a common front to Chinese aggression in 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 the Pacific and possibly even in the Indian Ocean. I would say that is now a reality. As you see, the the Chinese getting more assertive in the Indian Ocean region. That is a reality, and therefore we have to be. Uh, uh, concerned about the fact that we've not in that in our vision of the of the uh, 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 Indo-Pacific, we've not been able to create that real space for hedging against China. This has become too conciliatory. Got it. What what, what is the what is the relationship between the Quad and the Indo-Pacific as as a sort of strategic concepts in your mind? In my in my mind, uh, the Indo-Pacific, the Quad concept. Uh, does not stem from the Indo-Pacific, but it is related to it. Right. And the relation is that in the Indo-Pacific, if there are four capable countries with the capacity to create alternatives, both on the infrastructure front, uh, as in create an alternative to the Bel Belt and Road Initiative, as well as come together to physically hedge against Chinese presence in the South China Sea, as well as in the Indian Ocean, it is these four countries. Clearly, you are you are disagreeing with the government of India's position here. I am not fully in agreement with the, I, I, I understand the rationale behind it. We, we need a relationship with Russia. I mean, the Russia question has not been, uh, not been addressed so far. And the Russians are extremely wary of the Quad concept uh, as also the concept of the Indo-Pacific because they believe that this is not just about balancing China, but also about balancing Russia. And, and we have a strong relationship with the Russians. So I'm saying that we have limited ourselves in the way we have viewed the Indo-Pacific concept because of our relationships with these big countries in the region. To, to add to what you said, in June um, last year, the current Deputy National Security Advisor, Mr. Pankaj Saran, then Ambassador to Russia, yeah. said that the quadrilateral format of the US, Japan, India, Australia is one of the many multilateral dialogues in the region and not directed against any country. It is not, he says, part of the Indo-Pacific region concept outlined by Prime Minister Modi in Shangri-La. Um, so he is basically in some ways disagreeing, the government of India is in some ways oh, disagreeing absolutely. with. The, the government of India would absolutely disagree with my position and I understand that. Uh, so, 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 so let me just elaborate, for the government of India it's very dangerous to conflate the Indo-Pacific with the Quad. 
because the moment you make that connection, it means that you are building an alliance against China and, and, and Russia. And that would be unacceptable to both sides, which is also one reason why we have not militarized the Quad. But let me just say one other thing here. The real reason why we have not militarized the Quad or, or we don't talk of the Quad as a, as a, as a, as a front uh, to, to combat what the, what the Chinese are doing in the region. The real reason we don't do it because when you think, when you make a coalition in maritime strategy, it is, you do it at a, at a time when the, when the threat from the adversary is clear. To be, to be fair, the Chinese have not threatened our interests in the Indian Ocean region so far. They are present here in greater numbers. Their submarines are here, the ships are here, they, they, have, they have these big anti-piracy uh, contingents that come to the, but they are not threatening us directly. I would say that the, the government of India wants to keep the trump card with, with itself. It does not want to roll out that trump card. If the Chinese get aggressive with us, uh, in, in, in do much more in, in Gwadar or maybe you know in Hambantota or have submarines coming in to, coming closer to our waters. I believe that would still be the moment when the government of India would like to in some ways uh, institutionalize the military quad. What would the militarization of quad entail? The, the militarization of Quad would, would, would entail, first of all, maybe the Australians joining the Malabar exercises. Right. Uh, maybe we would do greater uh, anti-submarine warfare drills in the Bay of Bengal. Maybe we, we would have an exercise somewhere in the South China Sea. So we would up the ante in some ways, but this is all speculative. I mean, I don't want to w walk down that route because at this moment it, it sounds like uh, conjecture. Uh, and yet, I would say that uh, uh, that once the Chinese begin to uh, come into the Indian Ocean in greater numbers, there will come a moment when they will have to deploy in ways that will cause friction with India and the Indian Navy. And I will not be surprised if then we talk, we begin to start talking about militarizing the Quad. Commander, I understand why the government of India does not want to link the Indo-Pacific and the Quad and does not want and, and sort of wants to make it very clear that this is not directed against any particular country. Right. I understand that logic as you explained to me. Now tell me your logic as to why you think that there is a China, very clear China angle in both Quad and in the Indo-Pacific um, uh, concepts as it were. Let me, uh, let me explain this to you from a Chinese point of view. One of the reasons uh, why the Chinese are so um, aggressively promoting the Belt and Road Initiative in geostrategic terms is that the Chinese believe, have believed for a long time that there is an American containment strategy that wants to bottle China up in the, in the Western Pacific. And the Chinese are very well aware of the constraints that geography has imposed upon them in that they are getting more and more trade from uh, the Middle East and Africa. And all of this trade has to pass through the Malacca Straits. So the Chinese, uh, in order to overcome these constraints, they are going to be present both in, uh, in, the, in the Western Pacific as well as the Indian Ocean region. That then creates, uh, that then, then creates a reason why India should be looking at having a greater presence in the Western Pacific as also the Indian Ocean region. Because once the Chinese are aggressive in our waters, we will have to have some kind of counter presence in waters where China has a greater sensitivity, where China is, uh, is concerned about foreign, foreign naval activity. Uh, playing the game in the Indian Ocean is going to be too, de too defensive a strategy for us. So, so if you were to look at this from a maritime strategic point of view, a grand strategic point of view, having a very limited world view uh, about what the, what the Indo-Pacific can do, simply be nice to everyone and simply make sure that everyone achieves their national interests. We have to have a more realist understanding of how this is all going to work out. Mm -hmm. That as the Chinese are going to have greater presence and greater, uh, uh, great, uh, greater sort of military uh, footprint, in, in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean region, India will have to have to have make some counter moves. And those counter moves can't be in the Indian Ocean region, apart from the fact that we can have some, you know, denial complexes to deny Chinese some space. We will have to be active in their, their waters. And therefore, I think there is all the reason for us to think of the Indo-Pacific region as a theater of, of maritime operations. So you are saying that India needn't be too coy about no, no. Uh, f sort of underlining 
the, the Chinese aspect in both Quad and Indo-Pacific. Right. I am I'm simply making the point that at this moment, I empathize with the government's position and I, and I know the whole logic of the Wuhan, Wuhan, Wuhan summit that was to have a sort of tactical understanding with China that you don't step on our toes, we don't step on our toes. But in, in going into the future, this sort of agreement is not going to hold for too long because the Chinese are inevitably going to be present in our waters and that's going to create friction with us and, it, and we better prepare for a day when we have to sort of counter Chinese in the Indian Ocean as well as the Pacific. Commander, why was that rapprochement necessary in Wuhan that you don't step on our toes, we won't do anything to you? Why was that? What, what necessitated that? I can tell you my, my personal view of it. I'm, I may be wrong, I, I may be right, but my personal understanding was that after the Doklam crisis, uh, there was a, a degree of concern in India is that uh, we had in some ways allowed the, the crisis to escalate. We did finally manage it well, but it had escalated to a point where, where, where sort of anything could have happened because the Chinese had become extremely aggressive. In order to avoid a Doklam kind of incident, especially when we were very close to the elections and Prime Minister Modi is, uh, has, has this image of being a really strong leader, any such thing… And he has his hands full with Pakistan. And he has his hands full with Pakistan. Any, uh, any aggression on the part of the Chinese could have caused complications for the Indian government, and especially for Prime Minister Modi. And so I think that the, the, the need of the hour was to have a sort of a deal with China to say that we, we respect your stakes in the, in, the, in the South China Sea. We're not going to make too much of noise about what you're doing in the South China Sea, provided you don't, uh, you don't step on our toes in the Indian Ocean as well as uh, on, the, on the northern border. And, and that agreement, I believe, is still holding. How long it will hold, I don't know, because the Chinese are at some point uh, going to up the ante. And not to, not, to, not to hurt India, I don't think the Chinese want to hurt India, but it is simply to… And expanding great power. Expand, expanding great powers tend to do this. They have their interests in, in, in different corners of the world. And if the Chinese, once, it, once you have more Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean region, as we have seen as a reality, it's always not just in military terms, but also in civilian terms, in the, in the way that they are sending in their, uh, you know, the fishing fleets, you're sending in their, uh, you know, their, their engineers and workers to work on their projects in this, in this region. There is bound to be some, some sort of tension. This is interesting. Commander, so you are basically saying that China is probably the reason why India is soft pedaling quad today. Have I got that right? My personal opinion is that uh, India is perhaps soft pedaling the quad and the simple reason for that is that it is too dangerous to let China know at this point that we, we have a certain ambition with the quad. So, it's best to say that we are not ambitious about the quad. But I think that those internal contradictions within the quad members at some point uh, will, will either make the quad a completely redundant organization or the realization that we have not been able to present an effective counter to China is then going to lead to the awakening that we have to come together to, uh, to be clear about the fact that we have to counter China, we have to offer a… Commander, off you are being a bit too diplomatic. May, may I put it this way, uh, that uh, the, the concerns about pinpricks from China at a point of time when India is going into elections and concerns that uh, the pinpricks from China could potentially damage the electoral prospects of the ruling party in Delhi may have forced it to reconsider the, the, the contours of the future of the Quad, as it were. Yeah. And that would then mean that it is, it is actually against the Indian strategic interests. I, I, I just think, I let me just make a slight correction to that. I, I, I just think that I don't think the Chinese are going to make any pinpricks until, until the elections get over. Uh, I, th I think the Chinese have that respect for the polity here in India. But that's that, because you have a rapprochement with China. That's because we have a rapprochement with China. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that the moment the elections get over, then all bets are off. Then the Chinese will do what they have to, which is there in their national interest. And that will inevitably create a condition in which the Indian, Indian side will have to look for ways in which to counter China in the Indian Ocean region. And we can only do that if we have a full-fledged partnership, a working relationship with our quad partners. So, in a sense, you're looking at a lot more action in the, in the, in the maritime sphere in the days to come. Um, and quad is a major component of that maritime uh, ge geopolitics. As Absolutely, which is why we are doing anti-submarine exercises. When we did OS index with, the Austra with Australia some time back, there is a tacit understanding within the Navy at least that we've got to up our game as far as, far as anti-submarine exercises is concerned, which is why we are also building up the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, something that hasn't come up for discussion so far. But the Andaman uh, and, and Nicobar is a critical factor in, China, in India holding on to its space in the in the in the in the uh, in South Asia and in the Bay of Bengal, 
uh, a lot of Chinese activity now happens in South Asia in Bay of Bengal and the reason why we are, we are now building up a lot of our uh, smaller uh, facilities there into aviation bases trying to, uh, trying to deploy the PATIs, trying to have better surveillance in that area simply to keep a track of Chinese submarines. So, I am saying while the Indian government has not officially said all of these things so far, the fact is that the Navy by itself, the Indian Navy by itself is preparing for a time when it might have to actually face up to China. No wonder the Chief of Naval Staff has just in the past one year, at least on five occasions, including at the Raisina Dialogue, spoken about our problem with Chinese submarines in our waters. The fact that the China, China has militarized in a way that they have uh, commissioned 80 ships in the last five years. So, all of these things do cause a concern to, to the naval fraternity and you have to take your cues from what the Navy is feeling. If the Navy is feeling the pressure of China, that means that there is a coming problem. Uh, some people say that India is the weakest link in the Quad and some people say it's probably not, it's, it's Australia that is the weakest link. What do you think is the weakest link? Look, I think that the, the trouble with the Quad at the moment is that each of us is a weak link. Uh, it's not as if the Americans or the Japanese have really covered themselves up in glory when it comes to, you know, showcasing the merits of the Quad. I think all the, all the four partners are complicit in making this a little bit of a listless organization. I mean, we talk about big things, yes, the fact that we, between ourselves, we have a great relationship, we are doing, you know, two plus two dialogues, there is, uh, there are trilateral group, uh, groupings, but we are unable to, to, to elevate our interactions to the real quad level where the four of us are coming together and doing exercises together, we are having a, a four-sided dialogue and we are simply doing that so that the Chinese aren't provoked or they aren't, uh, they aren't annoyed in a sense. And I think that is being a bit under ambitious because the reason we, we have the quad is China. Here is my last question. So, how do you locate Indo-Pacific and quad in, in India's larger maritime grand strategy? What are, what are some of the um, components of India's larger maritime grand strategy and how do you sort of locate the, the Quad and Indo-Pacific in that? India's grand strategy as far as I understand is to preserve its influence and leverage in the Indian Ocean. And within the Indian Ocean, the key region of interest as far as India is concerned is South Asia. As long as we can have the ability for strategic and operational maneuver in South Asia and that space is not shrunk too much, we are happy. Uh, that is the essential uh, grand, grand strategy that in, from an operational point of view. Of course, we have uh, an Act East policy, we have stakes in the Pacific, but we look at the Pacific as a, as a sphere or an arc of prosperity. It is not so much a sphere of maritime operations or maritime confrontation. How I would locate the the Indo-Pacific into this is that if you need to have some kind of uh, uh, a strategy wherein you are able to preserve your interests in your theater of, uh, theater of operations, you then need to need a way in which you can work with the partners that are willing to build your capacity or willing to offer you capacity. At this moment, the, those four partners are uh, or three partners are, are US, Japan and Australia. These are the three states that are willing to join forces with India and also build India's capacity in some way so that we are able to maintain our, our influence in this region. That is how Quad comes in. How does Indo-Pacific come in? I would like to borrow a phrase from um, an, an, an expression from um, Ashley Tellis uh, and he says that what you need with the Indo-Pacific is uh, strategic altruism. Uh, strategic altruism meaning that do not look at this simply from the prism of your national interests because that is a very narrow way of… It is not always quid pro quo. It is not always a quid pro quo. Uh, look at it from the point of view of solidarity with the other states and if we have solidarity with the, with the, with the interests of ASEAN, with the interests of Australia, with Japan and the other countries uh, and I would say even, even, even China, if we have a certain solidarity with all states, we would be able to have a a broader uh, strategic understanding of the Indo-Pacific concept. Now, if the Chinese are not willing to play the game by the rules as, as all of us see it, we need to have a counter strategy. But if the Chinese are willing to play the rules, if they turn and into… Where they are willing and to. when they are willing to, if they are, if they are willing to accommodate our interests, well then I am not so much of a hawk. I would say that we should go ahead and cooperate with whoever we can. But my understanding at this moment is that that does not seem likely. 
and we will need a counter strategy in the maritime domain and therefore let us look at the Indo-Pacific and the Quad in ways in which we can build hard operational capacity, maybe uh, 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 an A280 complex in the Indian Ocean region to create that hedge for an aggressive China in the future. Commander, wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.